Thanks very much, John. And today, um, what I'm wanting to do is skate across um, a whole range of dimensions of Australia's energy policy. Um, the reason for that is uh, twofold. One, I think we're in a rather uh, precarious stage with our energy policy and energy markets policy. And two, um, that not long ago I, I finished a, a report on this uh, very issue uh, for the Consumer Action Law Centre who were keen to look ahead uh, five to ten years to see what emerging issues there were that, that the consumer movement should be starting to engage with now and to play um, a role in that. And uh, uh, that policy uh, that policy paper anyway is one that that I, I hope will be something that that does start to influence particularly consumer groups who have to date been focusing on some very important issues uh, hardship policy and a number of other things but not focusing a whole lot on some of the big structural issues and the competency of the economic regulators and others who are really going to be making decisions that add up to huge amounts of consumer dollars but in my view and perhaps this reflects uh, 10 years in Europe where there is a much greater acceptance of the imperatives of climate change uh, a, a policy that's going to work uh, to, for, for sustainability. And so this particular seminar, one of the themes that I'd like to raise is what I've described as a, a policy trilemma. And I don't think Australia has come to grips with it. We're still at the stage, especially in the energy area, of considering the final stages of liberalisation of the market. And so the economic regulators are still pretty much locked into how can we make uh, the market more and more contestable? How can our economic regulation uh, be about uh, you know, RPI minus X formulas for efficiency and getting more out of assets and not the important balance between, uh, as, as I would see it, um, affordability, which is uh, a really vital thing. Prices in Australia for most energy sources have, have doubled over the last three years and, and I think I can predict fairly confidently that they'll double again in the next two to three years and that energy prices are going to remain not only a key political issue but are going to become increasingly the source of, uh, of social distress. Uh, more and more of the Australian population, the folk living on the fringes of society, uh, are going to be propelled into uh, an estate known widely in, in Britain as, uh, as energy poverty. And that is going to be um, a serious issue. So, so that's the first part of the trilemma is affordability of, uh, of energy. The second dimension is about security of energy and that cuts a, a number of different ways. Uh, energy security is about ensuring that networks are able to deliver uh, what people want and, and where and when but the way in which that's been approached in Australia so far is predicated upon the continuing almost permanent dominance of coal-fired generation, 70% of our current generation, and where renewables are still seen as rather outsiders. And although policy mandates uh, like 20% uh, renewables by 2020 are leading to um, investment, the policies simply don't recognise the validity of that and there are all sorts of implications for system security as the proportion of renewables going into the grid uh, gets above 10 percent. We don't seem to have uh, those planned into our system at all and indeed with a very aging um, network of, of transmission lines and a lot of the, the generating sets, uh, energy security itself becomes uh, an important point. The third part of the policy trilemma is about sustainability and as I suggested earlier I don't think that policymakers in Australia 
genuinely recognise the imperatives of climate change. And so we have uh, even, even the uh, much thought over carbon tax um, is actually quite a trivial issue in terms of, of changing investment decisions to a more uh, decarbonised future. And I contrast that um, again with the, the UK where instead of talking about 20% by 2020, uh, the UK has long since passed 50% uh, 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 renewables by, by 2050 and, and they're talking about 100% renewables um, over the next uh, 60 years or so. Now that's partly about removing carbon from the economy. It's also partly about energy security. Britain has gone through a number of severe shocks brought about by an increasing dependence on North Sea uh, gas and oil uh, from fields that are no longer owned by, uh, by British companies. Indeed, most of the uh, energy companies in the UK are now owned, owned abroad. And so those three dimensions of affordability, security and, and sustainability are three legs of a policy that I think are absolutely necessary if we're to have uh, uh, some, some real progress in, in these areas. And just a 30 seconds then about uh, uh, FEMAG. Um, this is a, a regnet seminar, but uh, FEMAG, the Foundation for Effective Markets and Governance, which is uh, hosted uh, by, by Regnet, uh, is a group of people, many of them also involved uh, um, with, uh, with, with Regnet, but our whole purpose is looking at areas in which markets are failing the interests of consumers. And we've always defined the interests of consumers in that classical uh, sustainability model of, of looking at the social, um, the environmental, as well as the economic. And to, uh, to see markets where those things get out of whack mean that, uh, that consumer welfare suffers in the long term and often in the short term as well. And so that's why the policy trilemma report um, was, was written in, in the first place. Australia's now 15 years into liberalised energy markets and that started off with the, the classical way of uh, vertical and horizontal disaggregation of generators, splitting them up uh, in the idea of, of having competing producers, uh, of course monopoly regulation of networks and then to have contestability in supply with, with competing retailers. And Australia, like uh, the UK and many other countries, um, went down that route. Um, it's my contention that we're still rather stuck in that model uh, now that many others who also went down that route uh, see that there are some profound limitations um, in, that, uh, in that market model. And that most recently, this was uh, re reaffirmed in the publication late last year of the Energy White Paper. Now the Energy White Paper, um, in my view, represents another interesting dilemma for Australian policy. Up until last year, energy policy uh, at the Council of Australian Governments level was managed by um, a ministerial council on energy. But last year that was subsumed into a much wider group that also looks at production. And Australia is after all the ninth largest energy producer in the world. We're the uh, second largest, uh, uh, second largest uh, LNG exporter, the largest coal exporter. And in my view what's happened is that over the last year or so the interests of Australia's trade policy has come to dominate our domestic energy policy as well, which is now somewhat subservient to that industry policy. Australia is very intent, and, and I can understand why, in continuing to win international markets, firstly for, for coal, but increasingly for gas. And that Australia is very much uh, marching down the path 
of joining the global um, LNG market and there are implications for that that I'll, I'll come on to um, in, in a second. But what it means is that the national agenda which in the past had been about the gradual liberalisation of, of markets, the privatisation of uh, state assets for generation and, uh, and supply and, and then issues about affordability, issues about consumer protection and making markets work. These are uh, now moving more and more to a national framework. Indeed from July last year Australia was due to implement uniform national consumer protection laws for energy consumers as well. But uh, just, just weeks really before that, uh, that, that date for everybody to cut over to new forms of, of regulation, um, four of the states actually withdrew from, from that arrangement and we still now have quite in, uh, inconsistent state-based regulation for much of consumer protection um, in, in energy and that's um, a, a real problem. So the question that I was seeking to answer in the report and one that I'd like to explore right now is is whether the market structure, the regulatory framework, the conduct of uh, enterprises in the market are really delivering for consumers and my answer is no they're not and in most respects uh, some of the key ones are uh, uh, are ones that are going to cause uh, problems with price, quality and performance of, of all of those suppliers and that consumers are going to be uh, the, the big losers. And I'd like to contrast that, uh, not that the UK um, has, um, has, has policies that are working, but after 20 years or so of liberalised markets, the regulator in the UK and, uh, and, and the government, remember it's a conservative government, so this is quite an extraordinary uh, conclusion. Uh, ministers, the parliament and the regulators have concluded that the liberalised market is essentially failing uh, British consumers and that there are some quite draconian interventions that are being made that re-regulate it to the point where you would no longer say that it meets classical definitions of um, uh, a liberalised market at all. And um, that would include, for example, a requirement that energy retailers uh, provide only four products instead of the multiplicity, hundreds. In fact, uh, when I was working in the UK at one time uh, there were 3,200 possible tariffs um, across um, the suppliers in any particular part of the UK. So an individual uh, trying to use buyer power to optimise their own welfare uh, faced uh, what commentators described as the confusopoly, uh, much the same as Australian telecommunications markets, financial services markets and energy markets. It's, a, it's an area in which there's a real paradigm problem I would say and that to date I believe Australian economic regulators and, and certainly in the policy departments are still uh, straitjacketed by the view that mere contestability, the mere availability of competing range of services is somehow the equivalent of, of delivered welfare outcomes to consumers. And that uh, I point to some seminal research by Professor Catherine Wadhams uh, in the United Kingdom where she was able to track a whole cohort of uh, consumers who'd switched their energy contracts and that um, more than a third of them switched to products which were actually more expensive than the ones they switched from. And, and that is something that's inconceivable to people of a particular market persuasion. But to those involved in consumer protection it's eminently understandable and the explanation is quite simply that people almost never initiate the change of their energy supply contract. It's pretty well always initiated by somebody else and in the UK the overwhelming proportion of those 
were by people knocking on their doors and persuading them uh, through deception, confusion and all sorts of other means, um, sometimes threats even, that they should change their contract. Um, when, when I was working uh, in the UK, uh, there was a particular outsourced uh, organisation in Scotland uh, who, uh, who, who, who contracted with a, a group of, of marketers and if you failed to respond to their uh, offer to you at the front door, a fair chance that your car door would be scratched or, uh, or, or that you'd be um, insulted or assaulted and, um, and, and there were practices of that sort. Even Virgin Energy uh, set up stands out the front of the Virgin mega stores inviting uh, young adults and teenagers to <coughs> sign a form in return for a free CD. That form happened to switch their family's energy accounts from, from vir to, to Virgin um, Supply. Uh, another agent set up in a local library near, near where I was living and just got stacks and stacks of electoral rolls and wrote out hundreds and thousands of contracts just changing people from, from one account to the other. And that this sort of uh, ruthlessness in retail markets almost led um, uh, in, in 2000 to the end of the liberalised market in the UK and it was with the uh, significant government intervention, the establishment of the body that I worked for, Energy Watch, uh, which more or less uh, turned some of those things around. But I fear that uh, in Australia, while there are some good regulatory interventions, they're somewhat patchy and they are still against this backdrop where the assumption is that switching is a, an excellent measure of gains in consumer welfare and I just don't think there is any evidence uh, uh, to support that. So at that policy level and then at an even higher one for economic regulation and that about uh, four years ago, three, three and a half, four years ago, there were some rule changes to the way in which the economic regulator uh, was able to determine the uh, satisfactory uh, arrangements for the asset base of regulated enterprises, uh, the transmission companies, and, uh, and they were still in the main state-owned. There are some places uh, where that's not so, but uh, they're pretty well all state-owned, and so state governments have actually got quite an unhealthy interest in high charges for, uh, for, for their assets because they've come to rely for revenue on taxation of their government business enterprises. And it's at that level that some of the rules were changed that made it very hard for the Australian energy regulator to assess the adequacy and the need for some of the network investments. I'm sure everyone has heard uh, claims of gold plating um, in, the, in the networks, which ironically was one of the very important points about the first deregulation um, in uh, 15 years ago, which was about ensuring that assets um, worked hard and weren't over-specified. Um, now there's been a, a lot of policy debate about that and I'm pleased to say that some rule changes that will give the regulator uh, a greater degree of independence and capacity to deal with those things does look as though it's uh, again achievable. But still, that's been a big contributor to many of the retail price rises that we've seen and many that are still to come. Um, and I'll touch on some other drivers of those prices um, in a second uh, as well. So I said that I'd touch again on the issue of Australia being part of the global market for LNG. At the moment, I guess most analysts would say there are three, three markets. There's a uh, the export market that we're involved in, which has uh, got long-term supply contracts uh, to Taiwan, Japan, China, uh, increasingly to India and, and, and South Asia. Uh, there's a, a European market and then a North American market. Uh, these are all now uh, coalescing. And that the, the problem with that is that in North America especially, where there are severe winters, the demand for uh, LNG can just spike very suddenly and very steeply and uh, with a price responsiveness that draws supplies from pretty well 
um, everywhere that supplied that market. As Australia becomes more integrated into that market, so too the supply and price issues for our LNG which, uh, and, and uh, natural gas, which up until now have been rather distinct from international trade, are going to be caught up in that market and we will face the sort of uh, price spikes that the UK has seen where wholesale prices of gas can double and treble in the space of a week and uh, as Australia switches over more and more of its power generation from coal to natural gas, um, this cycle is going to become um, more and more significant. And so one of the things that I've recommended is that Australia play a much greater role in looking at the international antitrust dimensions of that. Uh, throughout Europe and the US there is a linkage between gas prices and oil prices. It's a historical one because initially they all came from the same production process. In fact gas was seen as a, uh, a, a pesky contaminant to oil. And, uh, and in many places, in Russia even now, um, uh, most of that gas that's co-produced with uh, oil is burned. And so there's more gas just flared in Russia than the whole annual consumption in the UK. Um, and uh, as, as those markets tend to converge, oil prices of course can spike even when there is no shortage of natural gas. And that Australia is going to be somewhat subject to uh, this sort of phenomenon um, in years to come. Now there are some un imp imponderables there. If coal seam gas continues to develop at the rate that it is in Australia and in the US, it might well be that that global uh, market power is somewhat broken down. But that comes also at some other uh, costs of uh, environmental um, issues that, that need to be dealt with. And I fear that these things, which seem to me to be part of the international debate and have been for five years, uh, just sailed right past the authors of the Energy White Paper. And so that's why I say there's a trilemma, but Australia hasn't properly engaged um, with that. With economic regulation as well, um, I think that our regulators are often set still on what is essentially um, a policy, and, and it's been a policy that's delivered huge welfare gains, so I'm not overly critical of it, of, um, uh, of ensuring greater degree of efficiency in production and distribution and the development of market mechanisms uh, for, uh, for retail. But since the, uh, in the climate change issues require forms of intervention that typically Australia has been reluctant to engage in and that uh, we have a, a largely hands-off approach uh, which means that when changes are necessary and in my view uh, within a decade global trade rules and lots of other international instruments won't just encourage or enable but will require major trading partners to start imposing uh, taxes to pick up the externalities of Australia's laxity in, in policy. In other words, our exports uh, are, uh, of, of these products are going to find themselves under uh, taxation pressure and that Australia will be forced one way or another to recognise this at a time where a lots of the intellectual property in mitigation measures and things is going to be developed, owned and rolled out um, by countries who are economically our competitors and that we, we face uh, um, an economic future where there are going to be limitations on our ability uh, to, to recover those things. And so there is a scope for Australia to play a much more active role in this area with the International Energy Agency and, and international agencies as well. I won't say anything more about that. The white paper and lots of critiques of it are, are readily available for people to, to look at. Um, there is again around uh, lots of the world an evolution in the sorts of people who provide energy and that instead of uh, a retailer simply providing you uh, with the gas or electricity that you want and metering it, uh, they're morphing into what are called energy service providers. So that um, the theory is that you don't actually want to buy um, a certain uh, 
uh, amount of, uh, of gas or, or you don't want to buy a certain amount of electricity. What you want is delivered heating or comfort or the ability to cook and things like that. And that by contracting with people uh, to provide uh, a, a wider range of services, perhaps uh, using smart networks and uh, demand control and, and metering and, and different market mechanisms, uh, that we can get much closer to meeting some of the needs of the, of, of the changing grid. And smart meters are a big issue now in Australia. Some states have now regulated to prevent their rollout, while some others are mandating um, their rollout, which shows uh, a lot of confusion about the role of smart metering um, in, in our system. And that's partly because um, a self-evident problem that the designers of the policy failed in the first place to ad adequately consider the consumer dimension. Uh, whether people would really be able to, uh, to understand what was happening, giving people choice, uh, and the price effects that that was going to have. And I'd predict that the smart meter issue will roll on for the next uh, five to seven years as a major issue of, uh, uh, of, of contention. Uh, and more generally though, the role of consumers in energy markets in Australia has been largely underplayed. And while there are a number of very useful devices, there's a, a body that, uh, that does provide some funding for consumer research, indeed it was such a body that, uh, that, that funded that report, at the institutional level there are no real national, there's no real national voice for the demand side of the marketplace. Uh, consumer groups often have disparate interests, partly because of the different regulatory settings in the states from which they come, or the sectors from which they come. People from a welfare background uh, have a, an understandable focus on issues of, of price support and uh, things like that, whereas some from more economic backgrounds are looking at, um, at, at market structures. But when it comes to uh, this issue, there is now a proposal that was adopted by the Council of Australian Governments at the end of last year uh, to develop a national advocacy body for energy consumers. And that's a, a, a noble ambition and it sort of mirrors what's happened in the telecommunications sector uh, in that the, uh, the Commonwealth established the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, which has given voice to groups from uh, consumers with disability to rural groups uh, to small business groups and others to be involved in national discussions on issues like the national broadband policy and, uh, and rollout and pricing and regulation and they've just recently uh, spent uh, a mammoth two years in a struggle to redo a lot of the self-regulatory uh, codes, uh, co-regulatory codes um, in that sector. Um, in energy such a voice isn't available but the proposal that's been made I think is rather flawed in that it currently proposes that the consumer body will be a voice for all consumers from uh, the smallest to the largest and the idea of big business consumer purchases uh, being part of a lobby uh, with uh, individual or micro business consumers um, is just not a very sensible one. Their, their interests are quite different and the capacity of big business consumers to make their views known uh, is already uh, more than uh, adequately dealt with. And so I have a, a, a bit of a concern that that body is, uh, is not going to be as successful as it could be. Added to that, its mandate doesn't seem to me to extend at all to issues of, of sustainability, which I've suggested is a very, very powerful feature now, um, even though it's not recognised, and that policies do need to take that into account to, um, for, for the, uh, the, the future. And um, that's an, an issue that's open now, and there are uh, debates going on, and I rather hope that that circumstance can be improved um, somewhat. The, um, the issue of, of network structure is a highly technical one but 
the use, the, the development of the national broadband network, even with the modifications proposed by Mr Turnbull today, um, still uh, enable us to be able to use an, a national communication system to bring an order of magnitude improvement to efficiency and effectiveness of management of, uh, of energy and itself could make uh, um, a, a huge difference to the peak demand for power in Australia. You see, we are one of the, uh, the countries with the highest summer peaks um, in, uh, in, in the world, partly because of the, the load of, of air conditioning and, and things like that. And that means that some huge proportion, and I think it's uh, somewhere around 25% of the entire investment in transmission and distribution systems, which uh, adds up to many billions of dollars a year, is about meeting the peak demands for just four or five days a year whereas um, a much greater concentration on efficiency there and use of, of things like uh, load management, uh, smart metering and uh, a better rollout, it's starting to work quite well, of uh, solar voltaic systems can, can slash that peak demand and lead uh, with nothing more to quite massive savings in, um, in, in the needed investment and the price flow through uh, to consumers. They're things again which I thought should have been front and centre in the white paper but really don't seem to have got uh, the, the amount of treatment uh, that it should have got. I could speak also um, about renewables and a number of other things but I do want to provide uh, opportunities for people to, uh, to raise some, some issues uh, that I could respond to um, in, in that way. So I think uh, perhaps I should finish there and uh, just see whether there are aspects of that that, uh, that people would like to take up. Um, from <laughs> I'll speak on, on behalf of, uh, of FEMAG there that um, we remain ready, willing and able to work with anyone who wants to get better consumer outcomes in, in energy markets, but we're ready, willing and able to work against anybody who doesn't. <laughs>